recording started, and so it's good to have everybody here. You can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 50. And before we do that, um, and we'll do a little debrief, kind of a high-level debrief of this book uh, at the end of our lesson tonight, but um, talk to me. What are what are some, you know, it, this is, again, it's it's a uh, one of those very familiar uh, books of the Bible that uh, because it's got so many neat stories in it and so forth and some key characters and uh, uh, there's always a risk when you have familiarity like that of kind of missing some things and really fully understanding. But um, I'm not fishing for anything in specific. I'm just curious. Uh, what are some things along the way that you've learned? What are some things that you've been reminded of? What are some things through this entire series, uh, through the book of Genesis, verse by verse, that we started quite some time ago, uh, that resonated with you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it come alive. Right. And so, uh, yeah, these patriarchs and you know, where they started and where they moved all around and where, of course, we saw where God brought them uh, and so forth. So good. Good. Yeah. That's the beauty of, of when you look at this stuff and look at it on a map. Right. And it's like, wow, uh, these are real people and real things and where it is now. Um Good, thank you. Anybody else? God is sovereign. God is sovereign, right? And he's every single detail. Every single detail, that's right. He is very sovereign. And so, you know, we throw that word out. So let's ensure uh, that we're all on the same page. But when we say sovereign, um, the easiest way that I always explain to people is that God is sovereign because A, he's God, B, he's God because uh, he can do what he wants, when he wants, at any time he wants, in any form that he wants because he is God. God is not dependent on anything. Uh, he is outside of his creation. And so he is sovereign, uh, but he's also in his sovereignty. He is also all those other attributes of love and gracious and things like that. So thank you, Barbara. Anybody else? I think somebody else online started to say something. Yes, Christine. I thought um, the story about Abraham, and I kind of forgot, you know, he came from a pagan world and God still chose him and used him. And so that gives me lots of hope. <laughs> yes, amen. <laughs> amen. That's called pure grace. <laughs> yeah. In fact, even his people, the, the word of God tells us that God didn't choose them because they were any bigger than anybody else, that they were any more special or anything. God elected and chose uh, his, his people, the, the, the Jews, Israel, for his glory. And it had nothing at all to do with what they did or, uh, or anything like that. Just like us, in God's grace, he sovereignly, we didn't deserve it. And he did that. So thank you, Christine. Anybody else? That we'd also do better if we would follow him <laughs> instead of all trying to follow our own ways. Yes, we obedience is a beautiful thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we have a tendency to want to do it. I love that old song. Does anybody know the O-B-E-D song, o Obedience? <gasps> oh, I'm going to sing it for you. All right. It's go. You guys got to follow along with me. Oh, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Doing exactly what the Lord commands, doing it happily. Action is the key. Do it immediately. Joy you will receive. Oh, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Now you spell obedience. O B E D I E N C E. Oh, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. There you go. There's your song for the day. Yes. All right. 
we we used to sing that song a lot, but it's true. It's it is just the way that's how we show it. So thank you. Obedience is a good thing, yeah. And and we see over and over again in in all throughout scripture when there are consequences when we're disobedient, but he still loves us. And so uh that's where grace comes in. Anybody else? Just one or two more if you want to just share. All right. Well, let's open up then and go now to chapter 50. And uh, we're at the end. Uh, I think I shared with you, uh, the Lord has led me on our next study uh, to do the book of Colossians. Uh, so we'll start that Lord willing next week. And that is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, of course, they all are. Uh, so we'll be heading over to the New Testament and looking at the book of Colossians. I encourage you to read ahead and uh, read read through that book and um, uh, a lot of doctrine uh, in there also. Um, so um, in Genesis 50, so this is the end. This is the the at least as far as what God gave Moses to be able to write down in this particular recording of uh, the beginnings. That's Remember, that's what Genesis means. It means the beginnings. And so we're in letter D of our high-level outline. Um, we are, uh, uh, which started pretty much with Joseph and this life of providential blessing. And then now we're in uh, number 10, of under letter D, which is the subtitles. And this is God's master plan. God's master plan. That's your fill in the blank there for first. And then in chapter 49, which is just wrapping up 49, because it sets better context, because remember the original writings uh, were not broken down in chapter and verse and all of that. Uh, we're going to look at verse 33 and then all the way through the end of uh, chapter 50, but we've got some sub things in between there. So from 49.33 through chapter 50, verse 14, your fill in the blank there is the death, the embalming, and the burial of Jacob. The death, the embalming, and the burial of ja Jacob. Now keep in mind, by the time we get into chapter 50, uh, chronologically, uh, if you look there in chapter 49, verse 33, the Bible says, when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. In other words, he died. All right. If you remember last week, we went through all of that and the blessings and so forth uh, that were laid on his 12 sons. Uh, and then now he has um, finally passed. And this is recorded uh, that Moses wrote that. And so... Um, the rest now, we're at a point now, even at his death, uh, prior to all of that, what brought them, and this is not intended to be a trick or loaded question, what brought them to Egypt? What brought Jacob and his sons to Egypt? We know how Joseph got there and why, because he was sold into slavery by his brothers, but what brought the rest of them there? There was a family, family all right? And so the famine, God used that to ultimately fulfill his plans and purposes. And that's that providence of God that we talk about. Well, now we're at the place. How long was the famine supposed to be? Seven years. All right. So this is all past now. So where we've gotten to in Jacob's death, as well as to where we are chronologically in here, the famine would have been over. And um, life would have just continued on as they stayed there in Egypt. And we know that they're going to be there for 400 years. That was already prophesied way back to Abraham uh, that they would be uh, away from the land for 400 years in a land that was foreign. And so um, there, this, this phrase here of uh, 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 he was gathered to his people is just... Um, we know what that means. In other words, he he would was dying and uh, ultimately be with his people. And then we know where his burial is going to be. Uh, we'll see that in just a little bit. But it would have been those who preceded him in death and had exercised uh, faith in God. And so let's go now to um, chapter 50, verse 1. 
The Bible says, then Joseph, so J Jacob's just died, fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And so uh, Moses, as he was writing this, as God was guiding him, uh, we want to see, again, the grief of Joseph. And again, we know the story. We've been going to, ever since chapter 37, as we've been uh, been shown about the life of Joseph here, I'm reminding us again that ultimately it's about Jacob. It's all about Israel. It's all about the 12 sons. But Joseph was instrumental that was used by God to fulfill his purposes, to bring all them to him. And so um, uh, he is uh, showing his grief and so forth. One of the things, it doesn't mean that it did not exist, but God through his spirit, speaking through Moses as he wrote, it shares that Joseph wept over his father. Who's missing? Hmm? All the rest of the sons, right? So it doesn't mean that they didn't weep or mourn over him, but there's no recording in here that that is what they did until they start burying him and so forth. So just a little side note uh, on that. I thought that was interesting. Um, their, their response, of course, is going to be shown later. So let's look now in verse two and three. And Joseph commanded his servants, uh, the physicians to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Okay. That's again, the name of Jacob. 40 days were required, uh, for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept over him for 70 days. Day. So let's talk about that a little bit. All right. Now, uh, uh, you guys already know this answer to this was embalming um, the uh, practice of the um, uh, of I, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth. Was that that was not a practice, right? That was practiced specifically in Egypt, and so. Joseph gives instruction uh, for them to embalm uh, his father. Any thoughts as to why he would do that? He wanted to what? So there was a cultural thing that he would have adopted. Possibly. And yes. And maybe because of the travel would be so long. Okay, so there's the practical aspect of the travel of taking uh, the body uh, a distance. Any other thoughts? I mean, I don't think there's really any right answer in it specifically, other than the fact that I think there's a cultural aspect. I think also Jake or Joseph wanted to respect that culture from the standpoint of knowing that it's people, but it wasn't a sinful thing. In other words, we don't see anywhere in scripture to where embalming is sinful, where, where the process, the overall process can become sinful, if you will, is all the other beliefs and so forth that go with it. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So um, Joseph, of course, was probably closer to Jacob than any of his brothers, uh, he wept, weeps over his dad. He kisses him. And so uh, th uh, then those whose duty it was to care for Joseph's medical needs were commissioned now to embalm Jacob. And it says that this is a lengthy process. And so um, uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, uh, background, the process of embalming. Well, first of all, before I get you, because you guys probably heard and seen the history channel and stuff like that. What 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 is embalming? Ultimately, what is it? So it's preserving the body. What else? How do they do it? They drain the blood. They, yeah, they drain the blood. They take the organs out. They put salt and pepper on you, right? All these things. And then they wrap you. And they do this with a process that is intended to keep the body as intact as long as possible. All right? We do that now, all right? Uh, in this case, though, they do it through a mummification process. Um, and so uh, uh, Herodotus, 
which was uh, an ancient, ancient, ancient historian, says the body was given to the embalmers who first took out the brain and the entrails and washed them in palm wine, impregnated with strong astringent drugs, after which he began to anoint the body with the oil of cedar and myrrh and cinnamon and cassia, and this lasted 30 days to do all that. They next put it into a solution of saltpeter or nitro, nitre, nitra for 40 days longer. That's where that 70 days came from. So they allowed 70 days to uh, complete this embalming. So think about that. That's So Jacob's died in 70 days. That's two months, right, for all of this process uh, to be able to take place. After that, they bound it with swatches of linen, um, besmeared, is how he uh, described it, uh, with gum, uh, uh, being able then to resist uh, uh, put putrefaction. It was delivered to the relatives, the body, and enclosed in a wooden or paper case somewhat resembling a coffin and laid in the catacomb or grave belonging to the family where it was paced, placed uh, in an upright posture against the wall. That's why when they find um, the, a lot of these mummies, uh, a lot of times they were they were found standing up in these, in these things. It wasn't always the case, but that was some of the case. And then so as a gesture of love and respect and sympathy, uh, we're going to see here to where uh, they join uh, in the... Um, uh, the, the rest of the Egyptians there that fell uh, to love Joseph also um, uh, grieve with him. So that's where we start in verse four through six. It says, and when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh saying, if now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh saying, my father made me swear concerning I'm about to die. Um, in my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father, and then I will return. Uh, let's, uh, and then it says, and Pharaoh answered, go up and bury your father uh, as he had made you swear. So Joseph uh, has said to ask the Egyptian um, officials to petition Pharaoh. So again, let's get on to some idea of what's going on. Um, why didn't Joseph just go directly to Pharaoh himself? Notice here again. So there would have been a, a, a level of etiquette. Now, did he have Pharaoh's ear? He did. He could have gone directly to him, right? So yes, some level of etiquette there. And what, what part of the etiquette there is possibly why he uh, isn't. Uh, notice here again, it says that um, he said that Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh saying, if I've now found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh saying. So he's basically saying, you go tell him, you go ask him there for me. So a certain level of etiquette. Well, why else possibly um, did he not just go directly? Because he had been around a dead body. Okay, so there's a level of being around a dead body, going to the king, the pharaoh. What were you saying, sister? Same thing, right? Okay. Um, I'm sorry? Uh, well, there's, well, he had been in pharaoh's presence all before that, but it's possible maybe he was around the livestock uh, uh, probably before that. Don't know. Some other thoughts are, too. Think about this. There's a long period of weeping and mourning, all right? So Joseph, of course, being uh, you know a Hebrew, uh, he possibly let himself his hair grow and not shave and so forth. So he just wanted to respect the etiquette aspect of being in Pharaoh's presence. I got some notes here. Um, possibly some type of ceremonial defilement that would make Joseph's personal appearance uh, and appeal offensive to Pharaoh. Um, and we know that he was on the best of terms. We know that he could have very easily did all that. But again, there's this level of dual respect and so forth that's, uh, that's there. Um, but it is also, you know, again, as I said, maybe he's just unshaven and all these things. 
And so he 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 basically is asking for permission. He says, hey, listen, my father asked this specifically. He said, and let's go back here and look again. My father made me swear saying, I am about to die in my tomb that I've hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. So that was Jacob there telling uh, his sons, hey, I've got this place there that I've even hewn out for myself in the land of Canaan. Um, uh, and, um, and there you shall bury me. And if you remember, he was very specific to Joseph earlier. He says, swear to me, swear to me that you will get my body back there for burial. And so Joseph did. And so now he's coming to, um, uh, Pharaoh and asking this favor. So now when we get to verse seven, um, you know, so Pharaoh says, yep, go up, bury your father as he has made you swear. So Joseph went up, verses seven to nine, and to bury his father. With him went all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, that would have been Pharaoh's household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers and his father's household, only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. And notice there it says it was a very great company. Now let's just pause here just a moment. I know we know this, but let's understand on how things change over a period of time. This point in history where these 70 of, uh, that's Jacob, his sons and their families initially go into, uh, um, uh, into Egypt, into the land of Goshen. Let's see if you remember, how long from that point did Jacob live after that point? Close. What'd you say it? 17 years. All right, because that was the age that Joseph was taken from him. So I believe that there's God just gave him that second life, if you will, with his son who he loved so much. So 17 years. So now this group of 70, in 17 years, 70 people can have a lot of chillings, right? And so that that group has grown. And they're all still there in Goshen. And they're all, and then when we continue to read on here, we see a relationship with Pharaoh, this king of Egypt, who has favor with Joseph. And because of that, this favor that's shown on Joseph, his family, sending all of this, this great company here that's laid out. Now, you know the rest of the story. 400 years from now, ish, minus 17, how's things going to change? I'm sorry? They try to go and leave Egypt. Why? Okay, well, he did, but why did they want to leave Egypt? They were slaves, right? It was oppressive. And, and then, as a matter of fact, we know that Moses was on the scene that, from a practical standpoint, shouldn't have been on the scene. Why? To kill all the males of the Hebrew children. So we see a Pharaoh 400 years previous that has this favor for God's people. Fast forward 400 years to where... They hate them and tried to destroy them because they had grown and grown and grown and grown where, where we read in Exodus to where the Pharaoh says, we're in trouble here. These people are basically, it's kind of like, they're like rabbits. There's no matter what we do, they continue to just have babies. And if we're not careful, so they started over basically making them slaves and so forth. So I just wanted to make a point in that we have this huge um, uh, difference uh, in contrast between this Pharaoh and all this favor, 
But over a period of time, they start forgetting all of that. So just, just something to do. Yeah. It's possible and or it's like, yeah, I know the story of Joseph. He must have been a good guy, but all these millions here are like, I don't know them. Who knows, right? But that's, that's a good point. But they would have been good record keepers. And so it's probably somewhere in there that they just, it, but it was a different group too. It's gone from, you know, 70 to 150 to maybe 200 to close to 2 million. I mean, there's a lot of estimates on what that would do. So we see here in verses seven through nine that we just read, that Joseph was accompanied by this large delegation of high-ranking uh, Egyptian officials, many, if not all of whom, were subordinate to Joseph. Think about that. Because Joseph, these are high-ranking people, but Joseph was what? In, in the kingdom. Numero dos, right? So they're all uh, his direct reports and their direct reports and so forth. Uh, and so in addition, we see all of Jacob's Adult family were along for this. So some of the cattle and so forth and the children were left behind. And so attached to this large possession was this large company of horsemen and chariots uh, providing transportation and, um, and security. Uh, it seems that they were possibly that assignment. And so um, uh, let's continue continue reading here. So um, that we ended in verse um Nine, and so it says, when they came to the threshing floor of Atad, uh, which is beyond the Jordan. All right, so they crossed over the Jordan. They lamented, uh, lamented there with a. What are the words there that you see? A, a solemn. Um, if, if you have the ESV, what does it say? So it says in verse ten. It says they lamented there with what? A very great and grievous lamentation. That Hebrew there is intentional that this was like, it, first of all, it was kind of cultural, but also they're all lamenting. And the implication is, is it's all of them. It's not only the family of Jacob, it's all of uh, those that uh, were the Egyptians that were along with them. And so, um, uh, and then if you'll notice, when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was named Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. And so does anyone specifically um, have what that that word means, that name? I've got it in mine, but I'll see if you have it in yours. Yeah, or yeah, morning of Egypt, right? M-O-U-R-N-I-G, morning of Egypt. So they're seeing this, the, the, the Canaanites that are in the land in Canaan, and they're going, wow, this something's going on. This is the huge mourning and so forth that's going on. And so um, uh, they uh, refer to all of them as Egyptians. So they, you know, they didn't know any different. They just made the assumption that these are Egyptians because they saw, you know, the whole crowd there and the chariots and all the Egyptians and so forth. So let's keep reading now verse 12 through 14. It said, thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan, buried him in the cave of the field of uh, Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which all of those, if you remember early on with Abraham, all of these names, what was, what was, what was specific about that particular plot of land? Who, who owned it? Abraham, right? And in fact, they were willing to give it to him because they liked Abraham. Abraham, no, 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 no. I'm going to pay for this. In fact, he paid full price 
um, even though they were would have been willing to be able to maybe get a deal. Uh, but he didn't want any question. This is my little section of land, knowing that God ultimately is is giving all that land to his um, uh, family uh, through the centuries, right? And so um, they carried him to the land of Canaan. They buried him in the kiln of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burial plot. And then after verse 14, after uh, he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. So there would have been this seven day mourning that would have taken place once they got there. Um, and it would have been uh, primarily for the Egyptians, allowing them also one final opportunity to grieve with Joseph and his family. Um, and so from here, it would seem that Jacob's family then go on a little bit further with the body to this cave where uh, where Jacob was buried. And so God's all his promises were connected to Canaan, but Joseph uh, was not tempted to stay there. Um, it, it, in other words, he knew he needed to get to get back, but we'll see later on to where he eventually will get back to Canaan, uh, where he originally uh, went. So the burial's done now, right? And so um, they 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 got to head back, and they're going back to Egypt. And so somebody is gone now. The the patriarch by the name of Jacob slash Israel, he's dead. He's been buried. Who's left? Right? The 12 sons, Joseph being one of them, the rest of them. We got to think about how all this started and how Joseph got to Egypt and all of that. So you can imagine now what's running through their mind. And so you guys know this story, but let's let's bring it to life again. So in verses 15 um, through 21, um, we have your next fill in the blank there is key lessons uh, or key lesson of the book of Genesis. Right? God meant it for good. God meant all of this for good. Um, so uh, let's look here in verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. Now, why would they do that? Why would they think that? Sorry? Okay, so there's a level of guilt, clearly. Why else? So dad's gone now. So uh, he, they, you know, they may be thinking dad was kind of the only one that kind of held back. What are some other possibilities? It's very possible what they would have done, right? Dad's gone. We're going to finish this dude off. But it's interesting too, in light of all the stuff that they had experienced over these 17 years, being placed in Goshen, the kindness showed by their brother who, who made himself known to them and loved them and kissed them and all of those different type things. Well, that's, I mean, just from a practical standpoint, we think about it in our lives, that is the terrible thing about guilt. That is the terrible thing because we can carry that and we don't really fully understand grace. And that's kind of what I think that they were going through. And so... Um, um, uh, it's very possible that um, maybe we don't have record of them grieving at this particular time or even in scripture that maybe they were just kind of like more fearful. Don't know, all right? Um, guilt, fear, all of those different type things. But let's look in verse 16 through 18. Uh, it says, so they sent a message to Joseph. Huh? All right. So 
first of all, Joseph's still a very, very important man. All right. So, you know, yeah, he's probably kind of busy doing his Egyptian thingy, running the land, um, all of those things. Uh, but obviously, right, it's a lot easier to do what they're getting ready to do just in case. All right. So notice he says, um, uh, so they sent a message to Joseph saying, um, what's the first word that you see there that um, of, that's in quote marks to what they said? Your. Why didn't they say our? Your father, I'm sorry. I think there's, I think, yeah, yeah. Your, your father, all right, kind of ours. It's kind of like our kids. Isn't it amazing, right? If the kids are bad, all of a sudden they become the other parents. That kid of yours, you know, I thought it was ours, all right? Um, your son, all right? So your father gave this command before he died. Now, we don't have any record of what's getting ready to be seen here. So either they're making it up or we just don't have it recorded. Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, so they're saying, this is what your father said for us to say to you. All right. Um, Please forgive, and they said, so now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Now, notice here Joseph's response. Um, Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. Here we have about the fifth or the sixth, might have even be more than that, of something that the brothers are doing to Joseph. What are they doing? They're bowing down. What's important about that? The dream, right? That's what got him in trouble in the first place. And he said, these dreams, and I saw these things bowing down. They know what he meant with this dream, and all of these things. And over and over again, prior, they bowed down because they didn't know who Joseph was. Now they know who Joseph is. He is our brother, but they're also fearful because they recognize the power that Joseph has. And they see their brother weeping again. And so they, they, they come before him now. Before they sent the message, he's weeping. He come, they come before him and they fell down before him and said, behold, we're your servants. Okay. In other words, don't kill us. We're, we're just we're just your servants. And one of the most um, uh, a powerful couple verses in the Word of God, he says. But Joseph said to them, "Do not fear, for am I in the place of God." In other words, I'm not your judge here. As for you, verse twenty, you meant evil against me. Is that true? Yes, they did. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. In other words, God's providence, God's sovereignty in putting all of these pieces together for his glory, for his good, and to, to serve his purposes through all of this and we we again become so familiar with these type things and we believe it and it's a powerful thing but let's think about it in our own lives from a practical standpoint you know i think every single one of us could raise our hands and go uh i don't understand why this happened to me or why this happened or whatever the case may be. But even in mankind's sin, 
God is going to cause all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. That's for God's people. But even beyond that, uh, God is always bringing things together for good. And so uh, he says, you meant it, uh, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And here's why. Let's re be reminded going all the way back to Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 to where we have the Abrahamic covenant. Um, and God said to Abraham, your descendants through a very specific line are going to be like the sands of the sea and the stars of heaven. And God knew that the way to make that happen would be to preserve them and to allow them to multiply and to allow them to keep their own culture, their language, and their own differentiate. That's why, remember, we talked about why God had them in Goshen? Because they would be away from the Egypt proper. They were far enough away from them. The Egyptians were going to stay away from them. Why? Because they were shepherds and they were an abomination to them. And so God all during their process, bless them and bless them and bless them. And you can read right, go and just right smack into Exodus and start reading the story there that all that time later, God was, was preserving his people for a very specific purpose. Now, you know where I'm going to go with this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, all right? Um, historically, all right, so we know the story of of uh, we have it written uh, in biblical history, and we also have it in uh, secular history of what happened to uh, those that call themselves Hebrew, the Jewish people. So we start here, then we go into the Exodus, we go into that 400 years, they go into the land of Canaan, and after they're let go and let my people go, and they go into the land of Canaan that was promised, and then uh, then Joshua. Uh, said all the tribes had very specific places to where they were supposed to settle uh, in the land. They were to destroy uh, the very evil uh, 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 people that were in that area that God had given plenty of opportunity. Um, and they settled in the land. Fast forward a little bit further from there. Um, uh, they said, okay, over a period of time, here's a group of people they're living under a theocracy where God is ruling uh, and working through uh, various um, uh, mechanisms through the priesthood to be that mouthpiece. But what did the people want? They wanted a king. And that king, so God says, okay, I'll give you a king. All right. And he uh, appoints and anoints uh, who? Saul. Saul, good king, bad king. Started good, went bad. All right. So then he comes on the line. And then so God said enough with him. Uh, 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 he has disobeyed all those different type things because God already had somebody else in line. And we know that's who that's David. So David comes on the scene. The, the, the throne of David in the scheme of things was one of the best times uh, for Israel and their worship of God and so forth. And then, of course, we know the sin of David. And then David had all these wives and he had all these chillins. And one of the chillins that he was going to specifically to take his throne was who? Solomon. Solomon, good guy, bad guy. Good guy had some issues, right? Put all these 700 wives and then all the concubines had all these chillins and stuff around him. And God knew, that's why he says, don't do that. Uh, and sure enough, um, uh, Solomon starts going bad and he starts worshiping uh, some of the gods of some of his 700 wives. And so he goes rogue. And then, of course, you can even see that in the book of Ecclesiastes and to see his heart, he gets to the point. It's like it's all vanity. It's all empty and stuff like that. Um, but what happened during. Stay with me now. All right. What happened during Solomon's after he died right there were some other little uh those that kind of came into line but by then things are getting bad there's bad blood between the tribes we have benjamin and judah there and then the other 10 tribes there's a split 
not too long after Solomon. And so they go into the split and you have the 10 tribes to the north. And then you have the two tribes to the south in a place called Judah, which is where uh, Jerusalem is. Some time goes on. God's trying to get his people. He's not happy because his people are now separated, but also he's not happy. Why? Why is God not happy with God's people? They're sinning. They're getting caught up into idolatry. They're doing all these things that God said don't do, all right, because they had the law of Moses, so they knew, all right? They start doing that, and so God in his grace does what? Now, stay with me here. Not yet. Do what? All right, so you have the judges, all right, and then you also have some other dudes that come on the scene that they hate it. Because they were telling them the truth. Prophets. All right. So you had the judges. All right. Which kind of became these uh, these people that were like, they'd get in trouble. God would raise up a judge. They'd get out of trouble. It's that cycle over and over again. And then God kept sending them prophets. Why would God send them prophets? To listen, to warn them in grace. And it's going, if you keep this up, this is what's going to happen to you. If you keep this up, this is what's going to happen to you. All right. Now. So we know what happened. God said, enough. And so the Assyrians went up into the northern kingdom, took them captive, distributed some of them, scattered them, and intermarried with them, mingled them all up there. Okay, So you had some that were pure and some that were uh, mingled, eventually referred to as the Samaritans. All right. Um, then God continued to send prophets to the southern kingdom going, listen, your brother's up to the north. This is what happened to them. You better listen. And they didn't listen. And then so the next in line from a, from a uh, uh, kingdom that's going to come and not only take, the, take it all is who? Babylon. So Babylon takes them, takes them to Babylon all right, um, for 70 years. And then after this, hmm? all right, yes. So for 70 years, God had proclaimed 150 years prior that there would be a name king by the name specifically as Cyrus that would make a proclamation that they would go back. And that's kind of where we are in Ezra, right? So they do that. They go back to um, uh, the land. Um, rebuild the temple, rebuild the city. And so uh, between that time, from there till Jesus's time, I'm kind of giving, I'm, I'm trying to be intentional here, so please stay with me. So you've, you've got uh, that period of time to where they come back into the land. Um, but uh, there's some other things that are going on. There's some other people that want to conquer. All right. Well, not quite yet. All right. You have you have the Greeks. Right. And they're coming in and there's others. There's a guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. All right. And so he does. And um, they fight back. Who were the ones that fought back against that group? The Maccabees. Right. So the Maccabees come. See, you guys know your your history. So the Maccabees come. They revolt. And they uh, finally are able to overcome. And the miraculous thing that happened was what? The oil for seven days on a little tiny bit of oil that they found in the temple. And that is what is referred to as. OK, you didn't say Hanukkah, right? Yeah, you have to you have to get Flema Hanukkah. All right. So that's where the Feast of Lights, the Festival of Lights comes from. Was that a biblical festival? No. Is there anything wrong with uh, with um, uh, celebrating it? How do we know? Jesus celebrated it, right? So um, so then we now we're now now we get it fast forward and we got where the Roman Empire comes into play and uh, there's there's time in there and you you have Israel in the land again. All right, they're in the land, out in the land, in the land. All right. 
And then in Jesus's time, and just and Jesus is with his disciples, and they're walking by Herod's temple now, which was really Zerubbabel's temple, but they just kept building on it. And it's beautiful. It's got gold on the outside. In fact, history, they say that you could see it for miles because the way the sun would shine on the walls and the temple itself uh, and so forth. Um, and they're going, Jesus, look, isn't this temple great? And what did Jesus say? Yeah, he says, you think this, nah, I says, there's not going to be one stone laid upon, left upon another soon. And then, I'm sorry? Oh, yes, that's right. There was that 400 gap in there, right? Before, after Micah, to where we have recording again in Matthew. Thank you. So, anyway, so they're back in the land. Things are going together. The Romans are doing, they hate the Romans. The Romans don't like them. They don't want them there anymore either. But they're back in the land. And Jesus said, there's not one stone that's going to be left upon another. Um, and, and Jesus died. And then not too much longer, in about a 40-year period, what happened? 70 AD, they revolted against the, the, the Romans again. Romans said enough. They totally destroyed the temple, the city. There was a few that that ran off to Masada, uh, and they were going to like hang out there for a while. But ultimately, from 70 A.D., and God had already predicted this, had distributed the Jews globally, the Great Dispersia. And from 70 A.D., these people that moved to Germany, to Romania, to Russia, to Hungary, to France to all over the world that were Jewish people almost 2,000 years all over the world. But God said in Ezekiel 37 that I will bring my people back. When did that happen? May 14th, 1948. Now, here's my point of going through all that history. God intentionally preserved the Jews at this time in Egypt for his plans and purposes. God gave us predict, not predictions, prophecy that they're going to get dispersed all over through, through the world, but I love them and I will bring them back and I still have plans and purposes for them. And that's why maps that you find prior to 1948 does not even have Israel on there because nobody thought that that would happen. And that's where replacement theology started very early on going that, well, I guess all the promises to, to Israel now to, to the Jews is now on the church. No, 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 no. And there was, there was quite a few historically that believed it said they get, I don't know how it's going to happen. You read the old writings of theologians prior to 1948, those that still believed said, I don't know how it's going to happen, but God's going to bring them back. And he did. So here's my point. He still has a plan for them. He still has a purpose for them. And he's bringing them back now, again. He dispersed them through um, through uh, tribulation. He dispersed them through, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Persecution. Now, is, well, how is God bringing them back? Persecution. Anti-Semitism is crazy especially since october 7th it's escalated even more there's people now the jews that wanted to stay in their land are going you know what the safest place for me is with all the stuff still going on is to go back to israel or to go to many of them most of them they've never even been there so god is bringing them all in uh what we see here in genesis and this writing here um uh that for many people that we should be kept alive as they are today, the point is, is that that was all fulfilling. God meant it for good. And God meant it for good and, and to judge and to spread them. But he said, I'm going to bring my people back. Now, sooner or later, his complete focus is going to be on them because the church, the mystery will be out of here. All right. So notice here what Joseph said. It's a long way around to verse 21. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. 
Thus he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. So Joseph here is, is exhibiting incredible grace. Joseph is recognizing that he doesn't even deserve the blessings in his own life. He's extending that to his family. And so uh, uh, the implication is here is that they get it and they grow and they stay in Goshen. Because by the way, the famine's over now. They could have gone back to Canaan, but they didn't. They stayed there and God wanted to do that. So now we see through the last part here, Joseph remained in Egypt. He and his father's house and Joseph lived 110 years, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children. Who's Ephraim? One of his sons uh, of the third generation. So he had great-grandchildren, all right? Um, the children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own, so he adopted them. And Joseph said to his brothers, now notice here, of the ages of the brothers, who's the youngest? Benjamin, but who's prior to him? Joseph, but he's dying here before his brothers, 110 years old. So the implication is here that the brothers would have to be older, all right? And so and Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He's reminding them, we're not going to be here forever. Our families aren't going to be here forever. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So he knows it says, when that time comes, I, I don't want to be left here. I want ultimately for my, my bones to be taken. When you go into Exodus and you see them leaving Egypt, there's a verse there that talks about them, and they had the bones of Joseph, all right, hundreds of years later. Um, so Joseph died being 110 years and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Isn't that an incredible story? Um, I put a final thought here for us. Uh, Genesis chapter 50 uh, is not the end of the story, right? So we also know it's only the end of the book of Genesis because it was the beginning of the story. Moses has yet four books to write, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, and God has ordained, of course, after that, another 61 books, that full canon, 66 books that we have, uh, before the final chapter is written that we see. And in the final chapters of the book of the Revelation, we, got, we once we return again to paradise. It started with paradise in Genesis chapter 1, and it ends in paradise at Revelation 24. The books, those are the bookends, right? Cool. And oh, C is the death, embalming, and burial of Joseph. Thank you. Did you already know, Tracy? You did because you saw the slash marks. <laughs> right? No, you. I'm sure you know ahead. Any any other thoughts or questions or anything? Mm hmm He was embalmed. He created a double blessing for Joseph. So those two represent Joseph. So when they go back into the land later, those two sons now representing one get a double portion. Any other thoughts? So when we go into Colossians, if the Lord allows us to come back next week, um, how many here throw some stuff out about what you know about Colossians? Okay, so they were a sister city to the Ephesians. Books. Yes, and also they were like during that period of time. Yeah. What else? The preeminence of Christ, right? We're going to see some very heavy doctrine in the book of Colossians as it relates to the preeminence 
that Christ has always existed. And so when you have someone who wants to say that the Bible never says that Jesus is God, we know many places, but it's going to be hard to get away, away from Colossians 1 and 2. What else? How about just, what is Colossians? What, why is it called Colossians? Right, it's a city called Colossae, right? What, what, were, you, what were you saying? Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. So anyway, I'm trying to just, just trying to prime the pump a little bit. I hope you'll come back. All right, we'll start a new book, New Testament. It won't be near as long because there are not 50 chapters in Colossians, all right? I was, I'm trying to think when we started this. I will tell you this, was we, were you part of us when we, the first time, two and a half years? Yeah, it was like way back then, right? Yeah, yep, it was, yeah, it was over two years. Yeah, and you guys showed up every week. Yeah, it was beautiful. So, um, so yeah, this one was a lot, a lot quicker uh, through all of that. So um, I'm looking forward to going through Colossians uh, with us. All right. Well, let's close a prayer. And um, uh, I would uh, appreciate your prayers uh, this week as, um, as we have our meeting, uh, our church meeting on Sunday night. But more than anything, we'll be in Ezra chapter 6 and maybe a portion to 7. It depends on trying to put those pieces uh, together. By the way, a number of folks, I'm very thankful. Uh, when you do an old book, Old Testament book like Ezra, you just don't know what the response is going to be. I mean, I'm going to preach it anyway, but I've gotten just a lot of encouraging response. So I hope everybody's enjoying Ezra as I am. And um, we're very good. All right. Father, thank you, God, for your grace, your mercy, your love. Thank you, God, for your people and so how much they're an encouragement to me for those that are online, those that are here on campus. And thank you for your word. God, thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, if uh, until we return together again as a church family on Sunday, Lord, may we have your blessings. Uh, Father, may you help us to be intentional in everything that we do to give you glory. May we be intentional for sharing the gospel. And Lord, we'll ask these things humbly. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. God bless you guys. Love you. All right. There's that head in the Bible again. <laughs> Whack them all. Yeah, that's right. The floating head. Uh, that's, that's great. <laughs>